Hi, my name is Akshit and I'm going to present the book Freedom for Sale by John Kampfner. So before I get started with the book, John Kampfner is a British journal journalist and he traveled to various countries like China, Russia and based on his experiences he, and some logical reasoning, he wrote this book. So I think the title conveys everything. The book is basically about how we give up our freedoms for certain things and sometimes we actively do it, sometimes not so actively. So. Uh, first, we we'll look at authoritative countries, dictatorships and democracies and see how things pan out in different countries. So first of all, it's important to understand it's hard to classify any country as a communist, socialist, democratic. So let's understand that there is a pact between the government and the citizens where the government says we'll give you this and in return, the people may have to give, give these things. So based on this pact, uh, let's look at some examples where, uh, Lord, uh, where freedoms have been sacrificed. Let's look at the example of Singapore first. I find this the most interesting country because it is one of the most well-off countries. <coughs> Singapore has the highest, one of the highest per capita GDPs in the world. So if you are living in Singapore, you are making a lot more money probably than if you are living in India or any other even a good country. 80% uh, of the houses in Singapore are kind of government houses. People live in government houses, that is the situation, so housing is not a big problem over there, even though it's a capital intensive country. Now my question is, if you get good infrastructure, everything is good in Singapore, you get better salary, would you go to Singapore? Your answer would be yes. But the trade-off here would be you will have to give up your freedom of speech. Because you are not allowed to say anything against the uh, government in Singapore. For example, it was ruled by just one leader for 30 years, which I think in itself is a very big thing to consider. In, in India, it's probably never possible. So you are basically selling your uh, people in uh, Singapore are basically trading their freedom of speech and expression just to get facilities like better opportunities, better infrastructure, better housing. And even if you look at the income tax set, it's about 20% uh, or less in Singapore. So even though Singapore provides so many good things, it does not have uh, any sort of uh, freedom to speech. And if you look at it, Singapore's neighbor, Philippines, which used to be a democracy, but is now not doing very well. There is an authoritative guy in Philippines now, but back then when it was a democracy, it was not doing very well economically. But you, could, you had freedom of speech and a lot of freedoms you had in Philippines that you did not have in Singapore. But the economic, uh, the economic situation was very different. So these kind of questions led me to think, will I go to Singapore where there is a lot of money and I, I, everything is being fulfilled, all my facilities are being fulfilled? Will I go to Philippines where I have hardly have anything? and I have democracy and I have the right to freedom of speech and everything. This is one of the questions that the book raises. We all, uh, when we grow up, take democracy for granted. If someone tells you it is the best form, it is the best form. The question is, why is it the best form? And what is the meaning of democracy? For me, it would mean government, of, government that is selected by the people. According to me, it does not encompass the definition of freedoms. Democracy only means a government that is elected by the people. Freedoms are an extension of democracy which are essential. I believe that it is ex uh, important. So the first trade-off, we looked at the first trade-off which was people are giving up their freedom of speech and expression uh, to get better facilities. Second, we look at the example of China and Dubai. Both these countries are not, not democratic. We all know that in, it's not, they are not democratic in a sense and both these countries do not hold elections. So people are giving up their right to elect a leader here and there's no democracy. People are giving up their right to elect a le leader but still their economy is flourishing. So we have to understand the kind of mindsets that people have in China. For example, the author spoke to someone in China that person argued that everyone should not have the right to vote because everyone is not educated and everyone does not have a good reasoning, especially poor people, they are not educated. So why should they have a right to vote? I'm giving this example because this is the kind of mindset that people who are doing MBA and all that are having. Like this is what John Kaffner says, people who are doing MBA coming back to China. This is the kind of mindset that these people have. And if you look at Dubai, the problem with Dubai is 50 to 20 percent of the people living there are native people. Rest of the people are outsiders. If voting rights are granted, 
they will be prob they'll probably be granted to the natives. So if everyone starts voting, natives start voting, they will vote uh, for what's good for them. And if there are other people, if I go to Dubai to earn business, so they will be at a disadvantage from that point. So this is one of the reasons why the gov government in Dubai, like one of the reasons that people argue that the government in Dubai uh, should not be elected by the people because it will spoil the economy, everyone will go away. So these are the kind of arguments that people are raising. <coughs> And uh, now we look at democracies, which I find most interesting because we all know that uh, democracies, India is a democracy. We have a functioning legislature, a functioning executive and a judiciary, which does not function very well, but still it is there. Everyone, we have elections every five years almost, unless there is a major uh, interference or something like that. So if you look at last example, which is the United Kingdom. Just like in the US, there were 7-11 attacks. In uh, in UK, there were 7-7 seven, seven attacks. There were bomb blasts by terrorists in which like less than 50 people were killed and several people were injured. Since uh, those attacks, the government started putting up CCTV cameras in almost every uh, place. This means that the government can track you. The government can look at what you're doing on the street. They can, they know when you're coming out of the house, when you're going to the shopping market, if you have a girlfriend, if you're meeting with your family, if you're meeting with your friends. So CCTV cam, the culture of CCTV cameras began from that time. Even in India, after the uh, Taj attacks, people, there, there was a lot of uh, surveillance that was going on. We have all heard about the smart city mission where the government wants to make our city smart. One of the uh, part of smart city missions is to enable surveillance, citizen surveillance. One of the, uh, every smart city in India is aiming to have a uh, control center, a command control center, where all you can look at the whole city. You can look at any CCTV camera in the city sitting on a desk in the command center, which is operated by graduates and people like you and me, who have access to private lives of almost everyone in the city. So. For to deal with terrorism, we are giving up our rights to privacy, our rights to have a private life. This is the kind of trade-off that people in the US are doing, which is also a democratic country by the basic definition of democracy. My point being authoritative democracy is seems to be very popular right now. Everyone uh, wants to vote for a person who is authoritative, who is decisive. That's what everyone likes. But I feel that we are compromising on our rights to freedom. If we are just voting for a person who is authoritative, that means we are nothing but robots. We want someone to give us commands and do whatever they say. My argument is we are not robots. We have a right to choose. We have a right to have a private life. We have the right to make our own opinion and decisions. And for that reason, we should not focus on authoritative governments, we should focus on governments that enable gov governance, that allow us to do what we want and work for the welfare of people. Authoritative, authorita authoritarianism as a criteria for selecting someone is a weird idea to me. He's a very authoritative guy, he can make decisions, so what? That doesn't mean he should be the prime minister, chief minister, my municipal body, body governor or whatever. So my, uh, this is uh, all about the book. Democracy is failing today. A lot of uh, countries with communist ideologies are doing well, who have moved to capitalism. Capitalism is flourishing, authoritarian governments are flourishing, but rights and freedoms of people are deteriorating. If we don't act now, we'll have nothing left in the next 20-30 uh, years. So if we, want not, if we don't want to be robots, it's now is the time to act against authoritative regimes. Thank you. <laughs>